Hi, everyone. Oops, sorry, a little loud. Uh, my name is Rahul Pathak. I'm the general manager of uh, Amazon EMR and Amazon Athena at AWS. I've been there about five years. These are a couple of our big data and analytics services. Thank you very much for having me and for coming here. And I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing with big data and higher education and how big data in the cloud uh, can help you. And it's not just higher education, really. It's all levels of education. Uh, so let's dive in. And uh, thanks again. Uh, so just to level set a little bit, uh, you know, big data is one of these very overloaded terms that means nine different things when you have five different people in the room. Uh, but basically, uh, we think about big data as uh, a set of terms that covers what you need to do when your data sets become so large and diverse that you actually need to think about innovating about how to manage them and put them to work. So there's a set of technologies uh, and best practices we provide that let our customers use these effectively. Uh, and if you think about any uh, large-scale analytic application today, what you've got is systems generating tons of data. So everyone here probably has a mobile phone, uh, unless you've lost it. Uh, you know, just about everything in our, in our lives is generating data continuously. I think I read a stat that uh, one-third of the mobile phone activations in the US last year were actually cars. So even your cars are continuously connected. And so there's a lower cost and increased velocity of data being generated. And what that means is that, uh, you know, historically, while data volumes have gone up and there are more data than ever is being generated, we've had constraints around how we can consume that data, how we can collect it, store it, analyze it, do something useful with it. And ultimately, data is only valuable if you can take some action that you weren't otherwise able to know you should take beforehand. And so these constraints uh, create a gap. And the gap is between data that's being generated, which is skyrocketing, uh, and data that's available for analysis, which is growing at a much slower rate, uh, simply because of these historical constraints that have existed in our ability to make sense of this data. And what we're trying to do at AWS is to eliminate the constraints around managing and dealing with large volumes of diverse data so that you can then put that data to work to build better applications, to find efficiencies in your institutions, to help students succeed, um, and to boost retention rates and learning rates. And so what we've done is um, created a, a platform for big data where we provide a set of components that allow you to focus on the things that are differentiating for your institutions and your students and your businesses, uh, rather than spend time with the mechanics of keeping systems up and running. And we wanted these platforms to be low cost so you can get started uh, small, but then know that you can scale up successfully uh, if you need to do so. And uh, what we found with our customers is that Agility matters a lot. In the past, it might have taken seven months to stand up a data warehouse. If you can do it in five minutes at a small scale, knowing that you can scale it much larger if you're successful, uh, you can run many more experiments, and you can increase the rate of learning that you're experiencing and get to better outcomes more quickly. Uh, and so we have a big platform uh, of services that are designed to work together. And uh, I know you're probably really excited because you think I'm going to go through each of these in mind-numbing technical detail, but I'm not. Uh, so sorry to disappoint you. But uh, if you think about it, uh, with data acquisition, you've got multiple ways to bring data in. Uh, we provide everything from real-time streaming data coming off of mobile apps to uh, we will drive up an 18-wheeler to your data centers and fill it full of data and bring it back to ours if that's what you need with cold data sets. Uh, for data storage, we've got very low cost, very large-scale systems, and then a bunch of uh, options on the analytics side to help you make sense of that data, whether it's in real time, reporting or, or using some deep learning technologies. And then there's been a lot of discussion about data interop and sharing data across institutions. Uh, and we provide a range of services to allow people to collaborate around data itself. So for example, uh, S3, which is on here, was one of our first services. It's designed to allow you to store very large volumes of data. And we have uh, a number of institutions collaborating on genomics data. So they all publish their data to S3. It's a public data set and they can all consume it uh, at their own paces, but share the data uh, without incurring costs. And so that makes that interop and transfer easier. So as standards emerge, uh, we think a lot of these technologies will also help customers with that set of goals as well. Uh, and in addition to core platform services around big data, we also offer uh, a bunch of AI services to our customers. And uh, what we've done is try to encapsulate a lot of what we've learned at AI at Amazon over the years, two decades, uh, and build them into easy-to-use services that can be built into applications. So Lex, 
uh, was named for the heart of Alexa, which is our uh, voice-activated assistant. It's the same speaker technology that allows Alexa to understand what you're saying. That's available to you to build into your own applications. Uh, Polly is text-to-speech, so you can type in text and Polly will translate it real-time uh, to over 20 languages. Uh, there's no cost for saving and reusing those sound clips. So you can imagine one-to-many communication uh, becomes possible. And then recognition is for large-scale image recognition. So it can look at millions of images, extract features, recognize faces, recognize emotions. Uh, and that's also being used by a number of our customers in this segment. And I'll talk about what they're doing uh, in just a second. Uh, and what we're trying to do at AWS is to give our customers uh, a set of building blocks. Think of them as sort of components in a Lego set that you can assemble into applications to fulfill any sort of end-to-end -end need. And we want to cover what we think of as the sort of three main buckets of analytic applications. One is reporting. Uh, what happened in the past? What's my enrollment like this year versus last year? Uh, there's real-time processing, so what's happening right now? Does it look like this person is about to drop off this particular online course? Can we do something else? Someone's visited our website. They've clicked through three links. What's the fourth thing I should show them to get them to sign up? Uh, maybe we've made a change to our mobile app, and it's now generating errors, and I need to know in real time. Uh, and then predictive uh, and forward-looking applications, which is uh, how can I build smart applications that can adapt what they're doing to what they're seeing happening in real time? And this is where machine learning and deep learning can come into play. Uh, and it's got some very interesting applications in the uh, education segments that I'll talk about in just a second. But the, the basic idea here is we want to give you building blocks that you can assemble into templates that you can deploy uh, when you need to at arbitrary scales. Uh, and when you think about cloud computing, uh, really there's a set of benefits that we offer which allow our customers to move faster, save money, access new capabilities. Essentially, we're putting into place billions of dollars of capital investment into data centers, services, software, and hardware around the world, uh, which you then get to take advantage of at much lower cost. Uh, and you don't have to own it. You can rent it from us for as long as you need and then give it back when you don't. And so you benefit from the economies of scale that we're able to drive. Uh, you can start experiments and shut them down if they're not working well, you, or you can scale them up if they are. And then you can start to analyze this data to drive better outcomes uh, for, the, for the objectives that you have for your businesses, institutions, and students. Uh, and then finally, you don't have to invest this capital because we've done it for you. You just pay for what you need. Uh, and that's sort of a core part of what we're trying to offer here as well. Uh, and in different segments, we've had customers like uh, Shazam. Has anyone used Shazam uh, for figuring out songs, right? So they use some of our services to scale up to deal with Super Bowl traffic because they were fingerprinting ads during the Super Bowl. So imagine 100 million households watching TV for six hours and then going down to zero. Uh, so they're able to scale up, scale down a few thousand dollars, and they don't have to own any of this infrastructure. And this is the kind of technology that's available to all of our customers. Uh, and then in education specifically, if you think about big data and predictive apps, there's really a range of different types of applications. So uh, one of the ones uh, that's uh, quite common and growing is personalized instruction. So can you adapt course delivery to each individual student's needs? Can you keep track of the student's behavior as they're interacting with the course to try and see are they dropping off? Are they particularly engaged in this particular part? What have I learned about this particular individual from past courses that they've taken that I can apply in this case? Uh, so real-time personalization and adaptive delivery uh, to maximize people staying all the way from start to finish uh, is a big possibility here. Completion rates is another one, and I'll talk about what one of our customers has done here. But can you detect early if someone is going to drop off or at risk of not completing or not meeting the necessary bar? And can you intervene before that happens? Uh, in other industries, we've had similar applications. So uh, anyone here have frequent flyer accounts, gold status on any airlines? A few? Yep. Have you ever received one of those sign up for double miles between now and the end of the year emails? Right. So that's a churn prevention email. So what's happened is they've looked at your traffic patterns, and they've decided that you're at risk of switching over to a different airline. So they're trying to give you a reason to stay with them for your flying needs. And uh, I actually happen to be on both sides of this. So EMR, this, one of the services that I owned, was used by a major airline to detect frequent flyer churn. Uh, and they said they could do it with 80% accuracy. And I ended up receiving an email from them three months later asking me to sign up for double miles. Uh, so it was kind of fun to be on either side of that exchange. Um, and they were actually quite accurate, so I did fall into their model. 
Um, and then on student support services, if you think about Lex, imagine a voice application that a student can talk to saying, I want to take classes in economics, what fits into my schedule, and the system can actually interactively engage with them to give them options that they can then build. That's so much less frustrating than having to click through 20, 30 forms to try and figure out what might fit. Uh, and so Lex can help you build these applications that can interact with databases, but actually converse with students. And if you combine that with something like Poly, you can have a conversation in one language, uh, but you can actually interact and generate speech in multiple other languages simultaneously. So a lot of very interesting applications uh, that benefit students or in the support side uh, become possible. Uh, then recommendations, uh, it's a classic use case for personalization technology. So here, uh, what can I send someone to maximize the chance that they'll sign up for something? Or what can I send them based on what I know? So they'll sign up for a second thing. What can I send my alumni to maximize their giving? Uh, Personalization is a big part of this. It's a big part of what we do at Amazon.com. If you've got the, uh, you might also like these emails, or people also purchase this, uh, that's designed to keep you engaged. Uh, with fraud detection, um, you know, fraud happens. So you want to know if um, you want to minimize the odds that you're interacting with someone fraudulently, whether that's in a payment pipeline or they're signing up for something. Uh, we're actually also looking at behavioral analytics to try and detect cheating. Uh, some of our customers exploring face recognition for trying to make sure the person they're dealing with is the person that's actually in front of the computer at the time. Uh, so a bunch of things there. And then there's core technology operations. So lowering costs on things like data warehousing, web front ends. Uh, UCAS is one of our customers. They do all of the uh, UK college applications. Um, and so if you can imagine, they'll have a massive spike at the end of the year when people are signing up, and then it'll trail back down. And this allows you to essentially have this infrastructure available at time it's needed, but not have to own it year round, not have to provision for peak. Uh, so all of these things are possible applications, and our customers are taking advantage of this. Uh, and so we have over 7,000 customers in the education segments on AWS taking advantage of the cloud worldwide, thousands in ed tech, from small startups to very large scale applications. A lot of these will be familiar to you. Uh, we've also got uh, educational institutions, universities, online universities, community colleges, schools, school districts, uh, all using AWS for a range of applications that we've talked about. And to drill into a few of these, so Ivy Tech, uh, it's a large community college. Uh, they're actually using predictive technology to try and identify students at risk of not completing. And they're now able to, within two weeks of a student being enrolled, identify with 81% accuracy if they're, not, if they're likely to fail at the end of the year. And so they can intervene earlier with tutoring, uh, more intervention, more attention, and you can boost learning rates, you can boost completion rates, and that's better outcomes for students, and, and it's better outcomes for the institution as well. And then UMUC uh, was doing a lot of large-scale data analytics, and they're able to improve the performance of their systems by an order of magnitude, uh, 20x improvements, and drive down costs, save half a million a year. And that's money that can be deployed elsewhere while still getting more capability for the organization itself. And then with the University of Western Australia, they put, uh, put on a massively uh, online course. And they're able to do it at 1% of the cost of, their, of comparable systems, again, by taking advantage of dynamic on-demand resources. So, uh, we talk about low cost, we talk about scale, and we talk about agility a lot, something we believe passionately in and something that our customers can take advantage of. Uh, and on the EdTech side, you can see companies operating at really tremendous scale um, in real time. So Coursera, almost 25 million learners. Edmodo's connected with over 75 million teachers and parents and students. And then Remind has 25 million or more monthly active users, and they're sending millions of messages to each other every day to interact and to keep engagement high. Uh, all happening on the platform using those uh, components that I showed you earlier. And then with Civitas Learning, uh, they're providing tools for techno and technology for institutions and for students. So they've got a range of applications uh, that help faculty and advisors look at engagement and design learning plans. And then for students, they've got schedule planning. Uh, and, uh, and degree maps, how are they proceeding down their path, and they're able to generate significant uplifts in completion rates uh, and retention rates. This translates to better outcomes for institutions. You've got people who are, um, you're having a, a higher uplift in persistence with their degree maps. They're able to see a better path to completion of the program. And then you can have um, schedule planning and simplified schedules and personalized schedules helping with completion there as well. 
And again, this leads to better outcomes for institutions, uh, and you're getting better outcomes for students, more learning happening in general, which is a win all around. Uh, so when we talk about low cost and high scale, I want to just sort of put this in context for you. Uh, so uh, who here has had a pumpkin, pumpkin spice latte? Everyone, anyone? Okay, don't be shy. Own up. OK. And uh, who here has had more than one? All right, we need to talk, because I, I really don't understand that. But, uh, but that's not the point. The point is, uh, a pumpkin spice latte costs about $5. Uh, so just keep that number in mind as we start talking about cost and scale on AWS. Uh, so this is a social media tracking application. So this uses all of the components that you saw. There's a real-time streaming component to capture all of Twitter. There's some components that can store the tweets on S3 and load it into a data warehouse uh, for analysis and queries. Now, you don't have to own any of this. You can provision this. This can be saved as a template, so you can run it once a month and stand it up again next month or stand it up in a different part of the world if you're a multi-site institution. Now, if you wanted to capture all of Twitter, uh, that's 500 million tweets a day, uh, that roughly comes down to $2.30 an hour. Now, I, I'm from Seattle. We think in terms of coffees. Uh, so you can run this for two hours and 10 minutes per latte. That's about 47 million tweets uh, per pumpkin spice latte for tracking uh, all of Twitter, sticking it in a data warehouse, and analyzing it. Uh, with recognition, you've got facial recognition. It can do demographics. It can tell you if a person's smiling or not. It can look at attributes, uh, give you in information about image quality. Uh, it can also be used for face recognition at scale. So we have uh, some of our customers are using this to look at the uh, uh, making test authentication, as I mentioned. If someone signs up to take a test in a course, you can use recognition to see in real time if they're actually the person they say they are. Uh, we have other customers using it to do things like track politicians and interviews, um, security implications. But uh, with recognition, you can, uh, the cost per thousand images is a dollar. So uh, you, know, you can do 5,000 images here for every latte you choose to forego. Uh, text to speech with Polly. So Polly will take text, translate it automatically into uh, spoken words, uh, spoken text files, audio files in the 27 languages that you can cache and reuse. Uh, so someone calculated that if you're using Twi Polly to read you War and Peace, uh, which is about just under 600,000 words, it would cost you 10 bucks and 57 cents. Uh, and that's uh, so you can get about half the book or the war part uh, for giving up a single coffee. And that's about 276,000 uh, words in that area. Uh, and so what you've got here is uh, one latte translates to 45 million tweets, uh, 5,000 images, or 276,000 words. Sorry, the million is an error there. So um, you know, I suggest this fall you skip the coffee and start looking at your data, because you can do a tremendous amount for very little at scale on AWS. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, we've got time for a few questions. Otherwise, the AWS team's here, and we can chat uh, after the session. So thanks a lot for your time.